for me, I'm completely not subscribing to any of the truths that have been put in the culture in any area of my life. And I'm dedicating my life to pushing those boundaries of what can this body do? What can reawaken in this body? And I'm expecting this body to get stronger and more creative and more wise. And I'm not interested in the subject of aging because I'm eternalizing. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Julie Pyatt, also known as Srimadi. Srimadi is a mystic mother, musician, artist, chef, author, and healer who has lived her life immersed in devotion and expansive creativity. She is a way shower of finding the divine in all life experiences. Srimadi shares her wisdom from a multitude of life events that she has experienced as processes of alchemical transformation. In her experience, her life has shown her that it is the ability to hold the divine perspective in all life brings before you that allow for the deepest access to the meanings that life is waiting to reveal to us. Each life is created in the perfection of a unique blueprint that has inherent within its design all that is needed for its full expression. Srimadi is a powerful living example of how to love ourselves more so that we can live our unique design in full and expansive self-expression. When we live in this frequency, we bless all life around us. So thank you again for being here. Such an honor. And the reason I really wanted you on the podcast I mean, there's many reasons it'll unfold in a moment. I really love your unapologetic nature. Like I, and, I, and maybe that's an assumption. Maybe there's other aspects of you. I'm sure you're multidimensional, but I listened to you on your husband's podcast, um, which is a very well-known podcast, which rolls podcast. And uh, you were just so straight up about what you wanted from the relationship with him on, you know, on the air. And it's like couples won't even do that in private. And you were, you just said what you wanted. And you also said, you were like, you said something just about the unknown future of your relationship, even though you have a very healthful relationship, you were just being real. Like none of us know, but rarely do we actually want to just say it. So can we talk about this? Like, because I just think you, in your being, you're, you empower people through that fullness in you of just showing up and saying what you mean. So how, how did this come to Thank be? You. Well, that's really sweet that you're saying that. It's interesting, you know, how we all have our own experience of how we experience ourselves. And so, you know, sometimes my, my own intensity is something that my personality doesn't prefer. Um, and like my singing voice is super soft. Like when I recorded my first album, my friends were just like, that's your singing voice? Because my singing voice is completely different vibration than when I speak, right? And so when I get tired or I feel like, you know, I don't know, there's haters or whatever the deal. Sometimes I'm like, I'm like, I'm just going to stop talking. I'm just going to sing for the rest of my life. And I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to present these things, but I also have this other thing that I'm just very, I'm honest, not, not honest in a way to hurt somebody's feelings, but I'm not able to edit um, the truth of how I feel. Like it, it's, it's not, it's really not a choice for me. And that, that's why I wouldn't have made a good actress. I can't really slip into a feeling that I'm not in right now and then be that. Um, so, so thank you for saying that. And, you know, I do know that there is a moment, you know, when I get speaking on my own podcast and also really on every rich episode that I've been on, which is probably 45, it's like, because I allow the mechanism to go, that there's a moment of truth that comes in there. And I never know where it's coming, but you know, that's why rich has allowed me to be on so many times um, and it's kind of like an undeniable thing that just comes in. And so it's, 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 uh, it's part of my, my life print, the way I was made. And so I'm happy to hear that you find that inspiring. I'm, I know, you know, there are others that find it annoying, uh, but it's just who I am. And I, you know, that's, that's where, that's where we all have to sit, right? We all have to just be with who we are. Um, but yeah, I, um, I love singing because it's, um, 
I have a different, it's a different frequency in that format, but both, both are valid and I'm not going to stop talking and I'm not going to stop writing and I'm not going to stop singing either. So I guess I'll have to do all three. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. I'm so actually surprised by your response because I Absolutely. like kind of the initial response of, oh, you know, sometimes I don't like that quality of mine. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's like, and I, I think it comes out of the programming of that, you know, we, as women, you know, we're supposed to be pleasing, you know, and, you know, like, do you have to be so intense? Like, did you have to say it like that? You know, that sort of programming in, in the, in the culture, which is actually not in alignment. It's not divine. The feminine energy is a whole energy. You know, she has her own light source. Um, she sometimes has to be a, a lion. She sometimes, you know, Mother Earth is uh, intense, right? So not only are we pleasing, not only are we sweet, not only are we loving and nurturing and caring, sometimes we have to say the truth. Sometimes we have to affect, you know, get the, take the guns away from the boys. You know, sometimes we have to speak up for, for what, what is right. But yeah, in the culture, you can even see it in this planetary realm, the the, align, the association of the feminine with the moon energy is quite an interesting thing to reflect on because um, if you look into what lunar means, so lunar means lunatic, um, the moon doesn't have its own source light. It has to get its light from what they're calling a masculine sun, right? So this whole association of the feminine of being passive and pleasing and and silent and hidden and dark and all of these things is another system manipulation to keep the truth of what we really are so i only align with the sun uh feminine energies have their own source light and um yeah i uh you know within the relationship too is i i have spoken very honestly and forthright about what happens in a relationship. And I, and I feel like it's really a secret weapon because when we don't speak about something, it remains hidden and it can find an insidious way to become a virus or to become something that's not right. And so something in communication that's been normal to me is if there's something that is, that has found its way in and is either there in the culture it, you know, it's an ism that's thought that's predominantly thought by others, or it's an, a situation, an act, a thought, a, an event that has happened that has come into the relationship, or it's you're at a platform of a time that's different. So you're on the edge or the precipice of another experience. The intelligent thing to do is to speak that thing, to tell that thing that you know it exists. And by you calling it out, you take its power away. So it's no longer hidden. You've revealed what's sitting there. And then, you know, Rich and I may stay together. We may not stay together. But at least it's not going to be because of a manipulation of something that is, that is just there for, for a, a number of different reasons. It could be there for another number of different reasons. So I think that in a way it's my uh, knowledge of how to transform that is why I say it. We've been married almost 20 years. We no, I don't know. We've been together. We've been married. I don't know if it's 16 or 17 years, but we've been together like 20 years. Yeah. And so I was think I was talking to him about where is the relationship going? Like, what are we doing now? And I think I was, if I remember the, the time I was talking about that, you know, I really don't need to go to any more movies or go to any more dinners or, you know, I'm looking for a next level experience. So what are we doing next level? And also just acknowledging that, you know, these relationships are not finite, finite state, like a stable structure or a point of stasis. They're moving, breathing uh, entities. And so as I live life, I'm always aware that um, death is sitting there or a change, I would call it transformation is always sitting there. I mean, if we're not evolving, we, we can't not evolve. It can't not evolve and change. So I think by acknowledging that the impermanence of, of every experience in life and knowing that, you know, nothing is a given, you know, even your spiritual connection is not a given if you lose it, if you forget it, you know, you, we can fall again. So it's more of a wisdom of being truthful to the transient nature of life and what is our opportunity in each moment. And, um, 
yeah, let's, uh, you know, let's call those things out rather than suppress them. I have a good example that I think might be helpful and it might be relevant to women listening to this podcast, but it was probably, I don't know, three or four years ago, Rich and I recorded a podcast in a bed in, we didn't film it, which is just as audio, but we were in a bed in a hotel room talking. And during that, I brought out this um, thought, this prevailing thought or structure in the planetary system that says that when a woman is done giving birth after those years, then she is obsolete. She is washed up. She's over. And there, and the man is going to be picking a younger, there's a younger one coming, right? So I noticed inside of myself, the operation of this program, not based on any, anything Rich had done or anything like that or any actions, but it was it, it's there in the culture. I mean, it's everywhere you turn. And I had been exploring um, the Vedic lineage that actually um, this monk that I meditate with called Swami Vidyadishananda, who's a, a treasure and a dear, dear ally. He was reminding uh, me that this stage of life post childbearing is the most creative time in a woman's life. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how the culture immediately you know it's like even it starts in the disney um paradigms with you know the princess is in a coma she's only awakened when the prince kisses her and then there are older evil women that are ugly they're ugly they have warts on their nose and they're evil and bad so there's nothing good about the older woman at all and those are subliminal truths that get implanted in our energetic because we are a collective, right? So then we know that that's what's coming for us. And I think this is what breeds a lot of, um, you know, distrust ar ar around women and also operations of women of actually playing the role of seductress or manipulator or, you know, it's like, it's like we can't say that, you know, me too is all, a masculine issue it's also a feminine issue you know it's 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 both it's this it's this landscape that we've incarnated incarnated into and so how are we going to wake up and sort of transform that so i did a i did a self-healing on that construct and i i rescinded any and all participation in that program and removed it from my energetic field and that feeling is completely gone from my being now so I think it is something that we can do if you recognize it rather than suppress it and act like it's not there, call it out, call it out, face it, talk to it and say like, no, like that is not actually a truth. That is a, as an attempt to manipulate and suppress me. And so what I talk about is in my journey of letting my hair go gray and you know, I'm doing this. Listen, I mean, there's a lot of me, like I mourn the brunette that I identified with my whole life, you know, and Yet at the same time, it, it was like, it just arrived. Like, I, it's not like I planned it or thought about it. It was like, oh, this, this is happening now. And I felt that, you know, we have the power to reinvent what it means to have a silver head of hair. I mean, who said it was a grandma or a librarian or somebody who's like not hip or not artistic. So it's like, if I can do this and make it artful and I can be an example and be honest about my age and say, I'm gonna be 58 this year, and I'm taking dance and I'm choreographing a dance with my company. You know, it's like, I'm just, for me, I'm completely not subscribing to any of the truths that have been put in the culture in any area of my life. And I'm dedicating my life to pushing those boundaries of what can this body do? What can reawaken in this body? And I'm expecting this body to get stronger and more creative and more wise and not interested in the subject of aging because I'm eternalizing. So it's an eternalization. We are eternal beings who have taken a body in this realm where the death program is super Im imposed onto it. And so we fear death. So we make decisions based on avoiding death, right? And uh, what I'm saying is that this is a time like no other moment in history. And I'm open to things we've never seen actually actualizing in my body. So for me, it's a very potent new time of innovation that's, that's upon us. Mm. That's a very long answer to your very short question. That is excellent. That's what I want. I want you to be talking the whole time. I mean, I feel chills. I feel it's so incredible. And I mean, I think 
already your life has been a revolution, right? I mean, just for the woman and the ways we are suffocated, the way we're born into these ideas of you should really remain with one partner your whole life or else something's wrong with you. You better be the younger one if you're the woman. You can only have kids around this age. I mean, if I have like your numbers right, if you don't mind me reading some of this, because for me, it was so liberating to read about your life. You have had children from the age of 25 to 46. You've been married three times and you met your current husband at 41 years old and you're older than your husband. I mean, you are already embodied so much that women feel is impossible or less than. I have to make one correction. So I've had children from 35 to 46. So I started, I started late. So my oldest boy is 24 and my youngest is 12. Okay. Well, I mean, even still, right? So many women right now are told 35 and on. Yeah. Luck having children. Women are so amazing and resilient and multifaceted and, you know, we're the, we're the nurturers, we're the, and I am saying also femininely aligned men as well, or, you know, we have both. I think what we're doing now is we're finding out how do we balance the masculine feminine in the most divine way. So, you know, I had my own big me too stories, of course. Um, I came up in that age. Um, and I mean, not that it doesn't exist now, but it was like, really, (laughs) it was, it was like, uh, normal behavior when, when I was going through it. But, um, but I feel that we have this opportunity to really, um, embody the masculine and feminine. And also, you know, the masculine is always looking to the feminine to lead the way because it was funny because I had this, this information was given to me actually by an individual named David Data. And David Data is like a sex therapist or something. I don't know if that's his real title, but it was brought to me by my friend Colin Hudon, who's a tea master who has living tea, super close friend of mine. And we were on retreat in in Italy and he was like, you know, can Mia, my friend, have a workshop and she wants to bring David Data and it's going to be Wuda, our tea master as well. And he kind of pushed me to say yes. And then I looked at David's website and I was like, oh, like why did I say yes to that? Because I was, I was just kind of like, okay, so he comes in, he's awkward. And I'm like, what is this person who has no kids? He's not in a relationship. It's like, I, like I'm like, what is he going to tell me about this, right? But then he delivers these super profound truths. And one of them was, the feminine nature is eternally creating. She is just creating for eternity. Eternally creating, right? And the, the masculine energy represents the void or the pause or the emptiness. Like he's just in the, and he's just there. And so he said, no matter how much the man loves or the masculine loves his fed feminine energy, every time the feminine energy comes in his field, he cringes because she's disturbing his peace, right? And I mean, I I can tell you that I said that verbatim to Rich before I got this download. You know, I would tell him, I would be like, I come into the room and you cringe. And he would be like, I don't. I was like, yes, you do. Like, I can see you do it right then, right? So it was really liberating because it started to teach me about the qualities of the two frequencies and not to personalize it, not to make it like a big big thing against me or commentary about me that you know he doesn't he can't receive me of course he can't receive me he's a he's masculine and i'm feminine i'm always creating the other thing is is the masculine always knows by design he will never be enough for the feminine frequency (laughs) the other thing is is that the masculine is also concerned and worried that the feminine is going to keep him from his life mission it's universal totally universal and then um the other thing is by design the feminine energy will literally like sabotage the masculine to force him into his highest expression of who he is because she knows he's not living at his ultimate so if you look at just those statements i mean for me and my friends and people that i know like we were laughing we were choking laughing at the truth of that And then I don't know if this is completely true or not, but I'll have to go with it. So Colin tells me then like months later that actually it was a girlfriend of David Data's that actually channels these truths. And they're actually, it actually wasn't his knowledge, you know, at the beginning. And, you know, I mean, there are a couple, whatever, and, you know, he's helped tons of people and it's, it's not too, 
it's not to say anything about him, but um, it was a very profound awareness of masculine, feminine energies. So you say this thing, uh, this line, who will we need to become in order to co-create a world of love? Mm -hmm. And in such a polarized political sphere right now, I really love that question for self-responsibility. I wanna just hear your thoughts what you think as citizens of humanity that we can do right now uh, to within ourselves to start creating the kind of life we want without so much division, yeah. the kind of world we want. It's beautiful. It makes me cry when I, when I hear that. Um, the depth of really the profound nature of that. Um, and I, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I for sure didn't say it. I think this is from uh, my mentor and ally, Lisa Renee, um, sent this. And um, the, I'll tell you what my answer to it is. And my answer is Water Tiger. It's my spiritual mentorship community that I've created online. And the reason is because I had this perspective, you know, I have kind of, I have a very interesting background, um, you know, things that I don't usually talk about on the Ritual podcast, but uh, you know, I was basically in a mentorship um, training with uh, multidimensional life forms that uh, facilitate clearing of addiction, trauma, um, sexual abuse, uh, all kinds of things from the energetic field. And so I've been trained and reunited with these beings that I work with for over 20 years. And so I really know how to clear trauma that is being repeated you know you always have families and it's like oh well this has happened generation after generations after generations so what happens is in this planetary realm these miasms or these pains or these addictions or these traumas get lodged in the family line and they get passed down and so because we've forgotten who we are and we don't remember that we're divine beings and that we're multi-dimensional beings we don't have any way to clear it so um uh Water Tiger, what I, what I gleaned is that in my experience, everyone, everyone has their own perspective and their perspective is valid from where they're sitting. So a beautiful saint named Sri Ma Nandamoy Ma says, every man is right from his own point of view. So it starts to see the insanity of humanity trying to create a consensus around what is right, what is wrong, when we're billions of life forms that there's not, there's not one of us that's the same and we're all living unique experiences. So how can you get a consensus when there's not one life form that is the same? In ancient Tantra, when the student asks the teacher, uh, well, is intermittent fasting good? The answer is for whom and when? What about green apples? Are those good? For whom and when? What about smoking for whom and when? It's always that answer, right? So I'm sure, you know, I don't smoke, but I'm sure there is a condition where smoking would be the highest act. Maybe somebody witnesses a child um, killed and maybe in that moment, that cigarette or whatever that smoking is the thing that keeps them in their body. So there's a very drastic example. So here we are humans running around attached to our mental constructs, thinking we're so damn smart. And we, you know, we do, we like to do studies, not me, but like the, the greater uh, humanity likes, they like to be told that science says it's so. Um, we've decided that we have a bunch of DNA that's just called junk DNA because we don't know what it is. Uh, and we create these isms and, and ideas and attitudes based on what somebody said. And when we look, when we just go out a little bit and look at who's running the culture, it's feeding greed and money, and it's benefiting only a very few percentage of the humans. So it, it's, it's shocking to me that like two families really own all the wealth on planet Earth and children are start starving and dying. I mean, it's like, just imagine that you were one of the families. Like, wouldn't you do something? Like, wouldn't you like do something? <laughs> so it's beyond logic and it's a setup of sorts. And to me, it's evidence that there's more at play than what we know within our human culture of what is really going on. But now what do I do? Because what do we do? Because we're incarnated in this, in this experience. And 
what I say, what we do is that you dedicate your life to knowing who you are. And what I want to know in awe and wonder is who are you? How were you created? What, what do you love? What do you love? What, are, what is unique to you? I want to know everything about you because I understand that all of nature is created in perfection and divinity. And I know that it doesn't matter if you believe what I believe, if you practice the way that I practice, if you eat the way that I eat. I just know at the start that if you can embody who you are, that you will bless me and you will bless those that I love. So water tiger is a, is a spiritual way to know way where I offer a video call and I do a, a meditation, visualization, activation, initiation technique, it depends. And I design these techniques so that they're useful for every single, you know, anyone who wants them. Like you don't, you, you can be any life form, you can come to them and these techniques will lead you into a deeper relationship with yourself. So like one of the techniques that I present is mirror gazing, is actually em emba em embarking on a practice where you go to the mirror and you actually gaze into your face and many, many things happen. But it's this thing that the whole world is externally focused and we're going out, 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 out. And all of the answers are within. And they're within because we have the answers to the challenges, the puzzles, the opportunities. Um, you could call them crises, but I would call them opportunities uh, because it's going to catalyze something very profound in the face of this, these conditions. Because if everything's all easy, then nobody's getting off the couch. You know, like, no, you're not, where's your motivation? You know, unless you're inherently focused on what happens when we drop these bodies, what is really going on, what is the nature of life, who am I? Um, so what I would say is the answer to that is that it is completely individual and the, the important thing is to take on the quest, to understand that the most humanitarian thing you can do to bless all creation is to know yourself. And when you think of that's the setup, I just think like, how awesome is this life? Mm -hmm. Like how awesome it is this life that that's what we get to spend time doing. We incarnated into this form. The more like for Water Tiger, we, we work on really feeling these bodies as technology. So it's a machine. It's a high level divine machine, living organism. So if you know that this is what's housing your soul, how are you gonna eat? How are you going to treat it? Are you going to walk around telling it that it's ugly or that you hate it? Or no, you're just going to be, I mean, I touch my hands and I'm just like, I love you. Like I've just, and it sounds like we've been taught. So like, oh, that's so new age or that's so not cool. But it's actually cool to tell yourself shitty things all day long. That's really uncool. It's pretty simple. And for me, it's finding out what you love to do and doing that with such precise alignment and then sharing that with your community. It might be a big community. It might not be. It might just be your family. It doesn't matter. Consciousness doesn't care what you do for your life expression. It's not saying Mother Teresa is more loved than a gardener. It's just not. It does not care. It is your choice of life experience. So there's no game. There's no scorecard that's being made. No one is any better or any worse than anyone else. And this can go into deep realms, even in very intense areas of, you know, somebody's homeless or somebody's even violent. Um, in a, from a divine perspective, that being has a right to its choice of experience. And it is in a process of evolution. Now there's interference and there's all kinds of stuff that's going on that that needs to be cleared. You know, there's a lot of slavery on this planet. So, you know, make no joke about it. There's a reason that pedophilia is a billion dollar industry. There's a reason that people protect religious institutions that are brutalizing children sexually. You know, we have to, you have to understand the game you're in. This isn't about an Instagram quote that makes you feel great and it's all great. It's about, this is our opportunity. We've waited thousands of lifetimes to be incarnated now. 
And we, sh we would be wise not to lose one precious moment and also understand that we are eternal life forms. And so if that's far away from you, that idea or that idea that you could be a divine being, I would say the way that you figure out who you would become to create, create a world of love, you must become divine. In gratitude to our listeners and to support the making of this podcast, we want to let you know that you receive 10% off our online shop of relationship courses and botanical delights, including teas and skincare. You can visit oliviaclementine.com and at checkout enter the code LOVE and LIBERATION for the discount. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to today's conversation. It sounds like this is a path of devotion then, right? Like being there. devoted to the life force. We have to sort of like try to make up new words because even like the word God is so loaded. I work with so many people that come to me that have reunited their faith free of a dogma or an ism or a religion who are raised in very, you know, strict confines. But the problem is, is we got to be careful. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. You know, it's not that all of that is wrong. It's the control of it. So the really the feeling that we are free beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, that if I serve anything, I serve freedom. And the devotion that I'm devoted to is to the force. You know, like if you like just take it in a Star Wars in a Jedi way, I'm devoted to the force. I'm not devoted to Ganesh or to a religion or to Catholicism or to or or, or as me as like the soul, you know, divine one. No, I'm saying I'm divine, you're I'm saying all of it's divine. So, but what I can do with my personality is I can gain a great mystical quality and miraculous experience by offering my life to the force every morning and every night. And it's sort of like, not my will, your will. And then it's not like I don't do anything. I do everything. I vision, I, you know, I play, I'm like, Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I got this inspiration. I'm going to do that. But at the end of the day, I really have to release attachment to any of it, to the force. So I, I'm here to serve the awakening of humanity on planet Earth. I incarnated for this reason. It's not this big lofty thing that makes me, oh, so I'm talking all of us. <laughs> That's the opportunity for all of us. It's not one Messiah, it's not one this, it's not, and there's gonna be a lot of those factions, but I'm just telling you, find out who you are, do what you love and share that with compassion and love and generous spirit. And if you have to pick one thing that you follow, treat other people as you would like to be treated. It's that simple. It's the golden rule. And then, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with everything else. But the, the other thing that is important to acknowledge, you know, in the wake of the escalating Iran issues and the plane being shot down, um, we have to understand that we are much more than we know that we are and that uh, we came here to serve the awakening of a planetary realm. It's not a small thing. And so we have to face our death. We have to overcome our fear of death. And in overcoming the fear of death, not that you wouldn't feel fear in the moments before it happens. It's kind of like having a baby, right? Giving birth. It's giving birth to something else, but it's our fear of death that is keeping us small and keeping us serving institutions, thoughts, belief systems, and realities that are not in the highest of divine alignment. And when you faced your death um, and, you, and you understand the eternal nature of your being, you can experience immense freedom in that. And it's a process. It's not, you know, it's not like, but I would have to say that the devotion is my dedication to my pursuit of realizing my eternal nature. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, definitely, if we don't begin to contemplate deathlessness, then we will be living a, a life where we're very inter interested in self-preservation and short-term view. 
Yeah, you know, at this, um, at a plant power retreat last year, we had this conversation and, you know, we were a lot of times like, how do you overcome your fear of death? Well, you can imagine yourself into certain situations and just, you know, see how you would feel, like actually go there and meet it. You know, so it's like, I used to be afraid to fly at a certain time of my life. And then it was like, well, I'm not really afraid to fly. I'm afraid to crash, you know? And it's like, so now it's like, I'm you can explore like, well, how, how long would one be in pain? Like, let's say like when that happens, when that plane crashes, how long do you think we're in pain? And are we just fearing fear itself? Because I know from some adepts and very gifted, you know, expanded beings who have remotely shared like what happened after 9-11 happened. And it was literally like souls literally just moved into spirit form and started helping people. So it's like, again, I mean, even if you don't believe me or you think I'm crazy or whatever, it is healthy. It is, it is empowering to explore what that happened, what happens then. And I was talking about, you know, like a very extreme experience, like, like you don't have control over what happens to you, but you have control over who you are in the face of what happens to you. So again, um, you know, like if I was walking to the gas chamber, some controlling, you know, ener energy, I wonder what miraculous expansive beauty is happening within that group on the way there. Like think of the immense evolution that they get, that they get from that experience. Not that we would wish that on anybody, not that it's, of course, it's, it's demonic behavior, like all of that. But what I'm saying is, you can use the experience, every experience, you can choose your humanity and your spiritual power in every single experience. And to me, it's the only security you have if you have any security, because every other construct that you think is secure is not really secure. Your ego may be, have convinced you of that, but there is no security because the earth could just shake her body and could destroy an entire you know, country. You know, so again, going back to people who have thought that I've been marginal, marginal and unintelligent, I say the intelligent thing is to develop your spiritual connection, free of religion, free of dogma, free of isms, of your own connection to the force. And the more you, I mean, if Yoda was sitting here in this podcast, you know, he would say some amazing, you know, limerick or something, but it would be that. I mean, it is, we are of the force. We are, are of that. And that connection to that direct source is your safety. It is your direct and your lead, your guide. And when your time to drop this body comes, it will be your time. Like you said in the beginning, actually wrapping up about how I spoke, I spoke what people are thinking within the relationships, but it's not spoken. So we're kind of wrapped up into the same place again with it. So it's like, you know, it's sitting there and you know, you know, so embracing it and knowing and exploring it and going through it, you know, or if you don't, you end up serving things that are not in alignment with what it means to be a human being. I totally agree. I think too, just what you're saying when you were talking earlier about surrendering, it's not about you, right? It's like, what am I here to offer today? It seems so important than what you were saying earlier of really knowing ourselves, because I think so many of us have no idea what's going on within us. First of all, we're afraid to even look. And then when we don't look, we have all these forces that are controlling us that we may surrender to blindly. It's not like the same thing to surrender to the fact that you know the textures of your being, you know how you respond to different moments of the day, different emotions, different people. You actually know what's actually happening in your body. So you can then, from that state of courage, start to lean into what is going to happen to me when this body dies. I feel like you couldn't even surrender or explore uh, your impermanent nature without that self-knowing. And I think that's, to me, what I see so much in this world of making a lot of decisions that aren't consciously symbiotic comes from that lack of self-knowing. Nothing more aligned than a being that knows itself. And what I would say, again, is, is be careful. Let's be careful of thinking that we have to do something for the oneness or for the, for the greater. Because if you start from that perspective, you're going to misstep. Because 
you can't help anybody until you fully embodied who you are. So you have to feed, it's like, you know, you have to feed yourself first. You have to be fully expressing. And of course it's layers, but this idea, cause I think people go, you know, okay, I want to live a spiritual life. And so now I'm going to do charity work or now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to fight for veganism because that's what needs to happen, or I'm going to fight for whatever. What I would say is the gift that you really have to share is locked inside your own heart. That is the treasure. Those are where the treasures lie. And the clues to those treasures is what did you love when you were six? What did you love as a child? That's the treasure. So find that, get into it, get in touch with it and know that by serving yourself, it's a, it's a language thing. So serving yourself mean, meaning the, the development of this Phoenix rising within you. When you embody all that you are, you will transform the life. You will uplift the life. And there'll, there'll be levels of that as well. But again, I'm not saying that everybody has to decide that they're going to go work for some organization. I'm interested in the innovate, the inventor being the inventor. You know, we have the solutions to the opportunities that we're facing if we can get out of this idea that there has to be a consensus or that someone has to do something in a certain way. Yeah, that seems really uh, much more doable. So we're not waiting for everybody to be on the same page. We're not waiting for anybody. We just have to do our thing. We have to like know what our thing is and embody it fully. That's right. And then do it. And then at the end of the day, it's like, I can't drop my body at the end of my life and say, well, I didn't quite get to Julie Srinati because I decided to live as the Buddhists live. You know, or I decided... Uh, uh, you know, this spiritual teacher told me this. And so I did that, but I never really knew myself. I never really, and you know, there are layers and layers. And, and maybe after you go through this personal experience, like enough, there's nothing but immersion into oneness. I mean, that's for sure. But for right now, we're in this realm and we're here to express and create and be a part of this. And this is really a joyous time, as shocking as it is for me to say that in this landscape. In, in 20 years of being in discussions about the spiritual energetics on the planet, and it has not been good news, I can't even tell you the amount of celebration. It's literally like light is happening on this planet. There will be no World War III. There will be no Armageddon. It is not happening. So we have anchored enough of this change that there is going to be a shift in this realm for all time. Now, that does not mean that everybody is going on the same train. And uh, I have been advised that there will be groups of beings leaving in mass. And that is because it is not their contracts to go through the physical ascension on this planet. The bodies are completely being remade, re recreated. So we can look at these cataclysms and take the higher perspective. And, uh, you know, understand it's very, very hard. It's very, very challenging. And of course, it's challenging if it's your child or if it's, you know, your husband or, you know, probably less for me than it was me, but if it was any of them, you know, so I'm not, I'm not being callous, but what I'm telling you is that I can't help you. I can't help me. I can't help you by keeping a lower perspective. I have to take a higher perspective. And, you know, same thing. It's like I had a client that came to me this year whose dad was assassinated in Iran, an environmentalist. He's a beautiful human being. And this young man is there. And it's like after I feel his suffering, which I do feel his suffering, then we have to go high vibe. We have to go into who are they as souls? What did they agree to do together? What did his dad accomplish? What is the what is the result of this life experience? How powerful. So we, you respect him in his situation instead of pull it down, diminish it, victimize him. So that's, that's the Jedi move. If there's a Jedi move, that's the Jedi move. And maybe that's what you were talking about when you first opened up. Feels the same vein of your ability to no, have that clarity and to be discerning and just to say what you mean versus being afraid that people will say you're not being compassionate enough be smaller like come as small as me you are showing up yeah. shining it's yeah. beautiful 
Is there anything just in particular you want to share that's happening with you? Even, I mean, I want to hear about your projects, but just even anything that's on your mind right now. And You know, most of what I just shared. And again, it's like um, the thing for us to really realize that this is a profound privilege to be alive right now and to really understand that. And this is not the time to waste time or to be small. It's a time to really do do what you do naturally and what you love and really share that without um, imposing your view on another. We don't have the right to do that. You actually don't have the right to do that. So again, it's not for a consensus. I'm not looking for a consensus, but if I can show myself expressing in a certain way, and then that gives somebody else an opening in their own process, then that is, that is what we're doing. So in a way we're like, we're like activators that are awakening each other, Mm -hmm. you know, through, our perspectives and through our knowledge. And once you know, you can't unknow. Like I can't, you know, you, that, no, that's why knowledge is power because of that. And I guess what I'm, what I'm experiencing right now is I'm opening up to communicating with all that isn't seen in this realm. And I'm developing a very close intimate relationship with energies from that realm. And that's a very, I'm in a new, I'm in a new beginning of an entirely expanded relationship with um, different life forms. And I feel, I mean, the magic in my life on a daily basis is just crazy. (laughs) So, um, you know, things appear, animals appear, you know, uh, I get signs, you know, lots of stuff going on. But Um, I am in a process of asking to reclaim my memory. I wish to reclaim the memory that I had before I incarnated into this realm. So I want all of my memory so that I can know who I am um, as a multidimensional form. And I have aspects of that and threads that are coming in. And sometimes it can be kind of confusing and challenging to be a human and be in a relationship and a mom and all this other kind of stuff. But I guess they know me pretty well by now, so they're, they're up for the ride. Uh, so I am doing that, and I'm also just, um, I'm going to be working on a body of music in my singing voice. <laughs> so that's, it. that's something that I really want to do before I leave my body. So, and, you know, according to my indications, I'm going to be around for maybe about 25 more years unless I change my mind. And so I'm dedicating my life to serve the creation of a new reality on planet earth. It's everything. Like it's not even a mental decision. It's the being of who I am. And I guess, you know, one of the benefits of having lived this many years on planet earth is I'm just coming into myself. Um, It's a beautiful, beautiful time. I would love to hear more about the music as well. I mean, I have an amazing music track that people can download. It's called Shriya, and it's on my website, uh, juliepyatt.com. And it's a 30-minute sound bath that will give you a taste of what I'm working on. But it's basically my friend Amber Rhea and I did a devotional singing together every Sunday for a month. And then we just blended all the tracks and had uh, Harry, my nephew, um, Uh, produced it we added whales and nature sounds but it's literally like a sound transmission of healing so if you're stressed out or like the news has got you constricted you can put that on loud on headphones and just it'll melt every part so it's all of our voices you know just spontaneously singing together there's no words it's just sounds so um so that's something um that that i can share and that and the rest of the music is i'm just i'm writing right now Do you want to share about your other projects? Well, no, I really want to share about Shrimu. So I launched a a plant-based cheese company. It's actually a universal not cheese company. It's vegan, paleo, gluten-free, dairy-free, kosher, actually. We almost have our kosher certification, which is super exciting. Anyway, I launched this artisanal collection of not cheeses. I've published three cookbooks in the space. I've created almost 500 vegan recipes, plant-based recipes that are tasty and lively and have a certain thing with the cheese. You know, it's a little bit of genius that I've unlocked. Um, It tastes amazingly delicious. The textures are incredible. There are no fillers and it's a subscription-based model. So you get, it's a sacred offering. So it's um, Shrimu, do life, not cheese. And the do is devotional offering. My friend, Brian O'Hara, who is a 
fine artist who has read and written backwards his whole life, created the branding for me. And the, the coding or the hieroglyph, the pattern that is on the branding is the words devotional offering in reverse. So it's kind of what I was meant to do in my Vedic chart. My birth is, con is connected with the symbol of a cow's udder and a flower. So there's that devotion. Mm -hmm. I found this out after I named it devotional offering, by the way. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it's an answer to um, this opportunity that we have to eat in more compassionate ways, actually in completely compassionate ways, not even more compassionate ways. If any of us spent any time in an industrial animal, animal factory, we just wouldn't eat it. And it's, it's not humane and we are human and we're, we have empathy. And so it's a disconnect of reality. Also, um, these cheeses are like fermented probiotics. Mm -hmm. So they're actually um, healthy for your body and that they don't have any of the issues that dairy has. And then in additional, they are environmentally um, supportive and nurturing for planet Earth. So anyway, so you can order via subscription only. We're shipping um, US right now, but I'm flying to Europe in a, a week to set up production in Italy. So it's extremely exciting. Uh, we are meditators. We do a whole breathing practice before we touch the product. We have nature sounds that are piped into the room. And it's a very amazing experience of high-end, not cheeses. Um, so that's been really exciting. And we're creating a culture of awareness. Um, this is within our subscription community, but also within the people that are working there. So. Um, we are all committed. We consider this company a mission. We have these amazing black flight suits that we wear. Mm -hmm. And um, we're just, we're all in. We're having an amazing time. The response to the cheese has been incredible. So that is something that I would really uh, welcome you to check out. And the other thing is, if anything that I've said has piqued your interest or you're wanting more support in your life and you're wanting to bring the spiritual essence in subscribe to my water tiger community it's at juliepyatt.com it's about 33 dollars a month and every month i do a live video call you can send in your questions i answer everybody's questions and it's very informative because everybody's questions sort of pertain to everyone and there is a whole um, sort of catalog of healing techniques in there that you can choose and use and stream as you wish. And they are all in alignment with what I was telling, what I was talking about, of helping you to embody who you are. So it doesn't matter uh, if you have, think you have a lot of spiritual experience or you think you have no experience, experience or if you, um, you know, have studied, it, it's completely irrelevant. So we are all spiritual beings and no one is more or less than anybody else. And the community is super supportive for that. It is not an interaction with other individuals. We have enough external focus. So it is encouraging this deep relationship with yourself. And um, that's a huge joy in my life um, that I get to hold. And if all of that is too much for you and you just want to maybe begin someplace, I do have a meal planner, uh, that is less than $3 a week. And it plans all of your plant-based meals with delicious plant-based recipes, also ingredients and shopping lists. And you can get that on my husband's website, richroll.com. I will be reuniting my podcast for the life of me. Um, so I have a producer now, so everything is going to get bigger as we, as we get organized now so that I can really serve. So I'm going to be doing weekly episodes of For the Life of Me again. And that's on iTunes. You can find that under Srimati, S-R-I-M-A-T-I. -I. I think that's it. And I tried your cheese and I, my mother's French, so I grew up, I'm basically like half cheese. Cheese is divine. I mean, I would eat it all the time. So it really is excellent and really oh, Thank you. So grateful to have you. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you for inviting me on and for wanting to hear of my experience. And I hope we do it again. And please keep in touch. Okay? I will, for sure.